Hi, and welcome to Schmooze with Suze. I'm Suze Montgomery, your host, and welcome you back again. We've been doing this for over huh, 30, 40 years, longer than I can remember, but we are always anxious to have you come back and meet new people and new issues. Uh, we're probably not going to speak about politics with this particular segment, but I might save that for the next one. So I want to welcome my guest tonight. Mr. Stan Mantooth, who is our superintendent of Ventura County Schools. Pleasure to be here, Suze. Thanks for being here after all the hiccups that I, I kind of <laughs> lost track of the last show, so I apologize to Stan. How long have you been uh, superintendent? Well, I was just going to say the hardest thing is getting the calendar together. Okay, well, for you, yeah. yes. But uh, I've been county superintendent since 2008. I was appointed in that year and then ran for the first time uh, in 2010 and again in 2014. So I'm just about at the end of my first decade. So you're going to run again, I suppose. I th did throw my hat in the ring. It's going to be a pretty tough campaign because I'm running unopposed. <laughs> I was going to say, who'd run against you? Who'd be <laughs> foolish enough to do that? Yeah. It's a big job. Oh, are you, you're a local Californian, correct? I am, born and raised. Okay, in Los Angeles. Mm hmm And how'd you get to Ventura County? Well, I just, you know, kept migrating to the west. I grew up in south central Los Angeles near Exposition Park. Okay. And uh, family moved to Woodland Hills in 1960. And uh, I was heartbroken because that was like going to the country. There was nothing in Woodland Hills in 60. Um, the actual 101 freeway ended at Valley Circle Boulevard, and beyond that was a two-lane road that ran all the way from there probably to San Luis Obispo or maybe even San Francisco. Over the Norwegian Pass. Well, over the Caneo Grade. Which is the Norwegian Pass, yes. I think. Yes, and uh, you can still see remnants of that road in between the, the rows of eucalyptus there in Camarillo. I've Camarilla. never noticed, really. Mm -hmm. I'll look for it the next time. And then how'd you get into education? That's um, because... Kind of in the back door. Um, how? My first job while I was going to college was as a school custodian. No kidding. Yeah, and I loved the hours. It was a swing shift, so I could work uh, in the late afternoon and early evening and take my classes in, at college in the morning. And if I was lucky, I could sneak in a couple hours of homework when I got my assignment finished. Boy, you must have been very dedicated. I mean, that's a long drag. I mean, but you went all the way from custodian to superintendent? Well, it's a... That's a circuitous it, route. It, that's a long story that I don't believe we have enough time for. But uh, I just feel like I've been very, very fortunate um, to, you know, always embraced education, always wanted to be close to schools and close to kids, even though a great deal of my career was on the support side of education. So were you ever in the classroom? I've been in the classroom for seven years at the okay. college level. Oh, really? What did yeah. you teach? Taught school finance. And Interesting. Was, That's why you're a good superintendent. You're <laughs> on the numbers. Well, we try Got to it. keep try to keep everything solvent. We would not want of our school want one of our school districts to uh, belly up. How many districts do we have? We have uh, 19 in Ventura County and 20 if you count Las Virginas School District, which has territory here in Ventura County. Where? Um, West Hills okay. in that area. Okay. So that's a lot of employees. And Bell Canyon. Okay, now I know where it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, furthermost east. Yeah. So how many employees do you have? Well, if you count all of the school districts Correct. as well as our county office, there are a little over twenty thousand. 
that's a huge job. How do mm -hmm. you do this? It's a pretty big industry. Well, I'm luckily I'm just the head cheerleader. I don't have to do it all. I don't all. think you have to be no. You have to be a little more than a cheerleader. You have to be a really good administrator yeah. to be able to do that. I think the structure lends itself well here in this county. We're very very cohesive in Ventura County. We all get along. We talk to one another. We have the same kinds of values and the same kinds of goals for our kids. And the County Office of Education, which is my agency, is one that provides service and a lot of times economy of scale service to the local school districts. So for example, we do all of the payroll for all of the school districts. That's right, you used to sign my paychecks. Yeah, it's a, a terrible case of carpal tunnels. <laughs> <Yep>. um, <laughs> I and think I will, it's a stamp. And, <laughs> I, and I always tell people I will keep doing that. Um, but we also provide all of the internet service for okay. all the schools and school districts and maintain that. And we um, make sure that all of the teacher's credentials are current and valid. So we check those and we provide about 90 to 95% of all the professional development training for Which educators. is what I was always impressed with because it was a very generous amount uh, allocated for professional development so we could be better at what we did. And mm -hmm. I was always impressed by that because I don't think we had that before you came on board. Not to that degree. So you really amped that up and I was grateful for that. So thank you for that. Well, we think that a student's um, quality of learning is only as good as the person that's providing it. And you know, they need to be well trained. I was always impressed with the quality of the teachers that we have. I mean, I've been at VASE, uh, I just recently retired from VASE, but I'm not really gone, I'm still here. But VASE, uh, also, they're just by looking at that small little identity population, are very dedicated people. And it's probably true with all your teachers. I mean, there's probably a few that are just there for a paycheck, but they're probably the small minority. I think the majority of people that get into teaching are dedicated people that are really passionate about education and really caring. They're loving people. They're not just sitting there because it's a job. And I couldn't agree more. I don't think anyone's in it for the money. Boy, that's um, for sure. When you look at what we get paid as opposed to the general public, the huge disparity in pay, you've got to love it. Yeah. Well, there are greater rewards than dollars. Okay. And True. And one of the uh, programs that we also operate out of our office is what's called Educator Support Services. Now, so what's that? When a teacher graduates college and they've done their student teaching and they have their preliminary teaching credential, they have to undergo two more years of what we call induction. Is that the old BITSA program? Yes, it is. Okay. And that's what our office provides for, I think the, we have about six over 600 teachers this particular year in the program. That's but why I met your wife. And what's most important <laughs> is we have a 93% retention rate. And that is phenomenal. That's huge. That's much what's higher. What's the norm? What's the average? The, the, well, the depend, it's situational. It depends on where you are. Okay. And it could be anywhere from 50 to 75%. We I'm really impressed. pride ourselves huge. on, on um, making sure that these are the people that want to be in the classroom and they can be their very best. And what? when they recognize that, that, that keeps them going. Well, when you think about the role of a teacher in general, as you know, because we have fractured families, divorced, one, single parent family, homes, that type of thing. A teacher is so critical and so important to give to that child, no matter what the age is, the guidance that they need, not just the book learning, but the actual guidance. And I think your teachers really demonstrate that in a great uh, way. I get to see it. Well, I thank you for that, because even though this might sound a little heretical, um, I tend to place, certainly in the way our society is as polarized as it is now, a great deal of emphasis on social emotional components of our learning mm -hmm. and civic engagement. Oh. Academics will always be important, but there will also be brilliant people in this world. We want to build good citizens as well as smart people. And building communities is part of that civic engagement. Correct. A lot of your teachers I know, and myself included, that we get out there and actually work in our communities to make it a better place to live. And it's a type of role modeling. Well, hence, look at this past week when we had the kids march, you know, on the gun control issues. When we were, I was watching this, and my husband actually attended it, but I was watching most of it, and I was impressed by the amount of adults compared to the kid ratio that was in the local march here in the city of Ventura. 
it was like almost double, almost double the, you know, either it was teachers, it could have been teachers, but it was mm. adults compared yeah. to the kids Yeah. and the involvement. And it was a remarkable example of civic, civic engagement. I'm really hopeful for this. I really am because I really think, and especially the component of signing kids up to actually vote. And I mean, this is going to be hugely important. I've been working in politics almost my entire life since age 14. And I was get, I'm getting very discouraged because of the current political situation in the United States. And I was so, I'm, I mean, watching this every night and my head is hanging and I'm just like, oh my God, another day of another assault. And then all of a sudden the kids th came out and they came running and I'm like, you know what? This is the future. These kids get it. These mm -hmm. kids are going to change the whole landscape. I'm all of a sudden hopeful. I'm looking at this like, I'm stoked. <laughs> and well, you should be. I, I um, hope they can continue. There's a trite saying, you know, that's maybe a little bit overworn, but the kids are 20% of our population, maybe a tick less, but they're 100% of the future. Well, and the, what we're trying to inculcate in kids in the new standards in terms of creativity and communication and um, um, thinking for themselves is what I think is sparking kids to find their voice. I hope they're also so. finding their passions and they're I recognizing so that they can they don't have to wait forever to take their place in our society. You have some amazing other non-traditional like K-12 that I'm impressed with, like over at uh, Camarillo Airport, ACE, which mm -hmm. is uh, and I, that's architecture, construction and engineering. It's a charter school. I was blown mm -hmm. away. I'm a big fan of trade schools. I would really, especially now, today's day and age, we have a lot of people that, you know, that they're actually uh, making the transition from high school. And a lot of kids are just like going to community college because there's not a lot of choices unless they find vase by chance. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to see more trade schools. Is there, there any kind of hope for that in the future as well? Absolutely. Um, our career education programs in the last four years have absolutely flourished. We Great. are fortunate enough here in Ventura County to get over $30 million in state grants just for career education programs. Uh, what back in the day was, was called vocational arts right. Voc or Ed. ROP, uh, Regional right. Occupation Program. Um, pathways for students that aren't necessarily college bound or that are college bound but also want to have a highly technical component to their education. Do you have to actually go up to like the State Department and you know in Sacramento and actually advocate for these and lobby for this kind of uh, this kind of alternative schooling? Absolutely. You have, so but you have to go up and ask for the money. The pie is only so large, so and we want to make sure that the slices of it are going in the right direction. I'll volunteer to go for free anytime you want me to go. Thank you. I'd be more than happy to really endorse those programs. Also, senior ed, which I'd like to see expand into some degree as well, with our population growing at least in the city of Ventura, 30% is a huge number for seniors, mm -hmm. and that can swing an election too. So. Yeah, I resemble that remark. I resemble that as well, huh? The gray hair. Uh, I had a couple other questions for you. Would you explain to me what an LCAP is? Sure. I'm not sure I know. Uh, the LCAP is the companion component to the LCFF. How's oh, that? Oh, I knew that. <laughs> now, um, LCAP is the Local Control Accountability Plan, and it is co-joined to the Local Control Financing Formula. So in other words, I'm really th confused. these are two new paradigms which came into being in Governor Brown's administration, in a different way of funding education, so that there is segregated funds for students which um, are um, either English learners or students of poverty so that they get extra funding for extra services as well as base funding in, uh, in the, through the local control funding formula to be used at the local level. So is that allocated per district? Yes. Okay, so yes. You, since you have a district with that kind of a ratio, you would get more? Yes, and that's why Ventura County is an interesting uh, example of haves and have-nots because out of those 19 districts, about half of them have large concentrations of students of poverty or uh, students that are English language learners. Wow. The other 10, not so much. So they don't reach the threshold percentages to get as much of that money. But we think that's fine because that tends to level the playing field a little bit in terms of not necessarily equality, but equity. 
and the and and the initial acronym that you referred to, the Local Control Accountability Plan, right. is the companion piece that requires us to say how are we going to use this money to make a difference. So there's actually you. There's some. Uh, I'm sure there's restrictions, mm -hmm. but also you have to be constantly aware because it's probably shifting. Correct, according to the population needs. All the time. So your job, <laughs> I don't even know what. I can't even imagine what you do all day long. I mean, you're probably in meetings all day long, but this is kind of like part of the meeting structure. Correct. Well, we fix flat tires while the car is in motion. Well, this is it's, like. Do you ever? What do you do on your downtime? What's downtime? Oh, you too, huh? <laughs> you got the same malady. <laughs> downtime is really good for reflection. Okay, so... And recharging one's batteries. Do you have hobbies? Uh, I read incessantly. Yeah. Yeah. I figured you would. Mm -hmm. Okay, is cool. it always content relative to the job or escapism? Not at all. In oh, fact, what are you reading? every night before going to bed, I try to read for 20 to 30 minutes something which has nothing to do with my work. Trash? Uh, one, science fiction. Oh, that's, well, <laughs> that's one genre every, I never got into. Every once in a while, I get seduced by my Atlantic magazine, because that's another Atlantic. favorite. So I, I read I, that all the time. Yeah, I, I pay favorite. a lot of attention uh, to that particular publication. It's a, it's a great publication. Yeah. Boy, the essays. And it's not all science fiction. Astronomy figures big in my life as well. Really? Yeah, if there weren't so much light pollution, I'd probably have some better photographs. Really? Boy, very deep, Stan. I'm really impressed with that. Oh. Because astronomy is something that, you know, I mean, it was a big deal when we were kids, but, you, don't, you know, I know all about astronomy because we had the classes in school, but we never really progressed beyond the school thing unless you really had a specialized interest in it. Mm -hmm. So you read astronomy books, magazines, Magazine. lectures? Magazine and Internet. Okay. And uh, there's even an app that you can put on your phone that you can point up at the sky and it'll tell you exactly what's up there in any given part of the sky on My any given My husband John's night. got one of these <laughs> and he keeps telling me about this, but I've never really explored it. Yeah. It's just another one of those tools that we have for kids learning today in, in terms of the internet and you know, all that's available you know, that's not locked up somewhere else. How about early education? Mm -hmm. uh, I know Ventura County is very big into expansion on early education be for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, the county schools, I mean, do they focus on is this individualistic within the districts or is this countywide? Both. Okay. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, we actually have an entire early education department that works in uh, the area of preschool and interfaces with groups like First Five Ventura County. Okay. And I would just tell, your, uh, tell the audience, the investment in early education is probably the best one you can ever make, not only for the kids themselves, but society as a whole. Um, there's a Nobel laureate economist named James Heckman. He's out of the University of Chicago, who is not an educator, by the way. He's an economist, and he has developed equations which prove that the investment of one dollar will return, we used to think seven, as many as 10 to 14 dollars really? in our society. And so building preschools and facilities for early education will cause us ultimately to build less prisons. That's and a it's whole not, new subject. Yeah, and when a lot of people think of early education, they think of preschool. And preschool is something which is of questionable value if it doesn't have a quality component. If it's mm -hmm. quality preschool, it will pay off. But there's always the, also the year zero to three in a child's life. 80% of the brain is developed by the time a child is three. And that's why parents are so important. They are. So important. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. And when you have a child, you really don't think about the investment, but you really are investing into this child's life mm -hmm. and setting the stage and the tone for the rest of that child's life. Yep. Either they're going to be turned on by education and furthering, or they're just going to fail. And talking about fail, how about adversity? How do we deal with kids in adverse situations in our schools? Let's say high schools, middle schools. How do we deal with the adverse situations like that? Is there, do we have some kind of guidelines in place for that? Well, 
Part of the new Common Core standards dictate that every single child matters and that no child gets left out. You might have noticed, if you think back, that there would be children in classes that you attended that didn't act out, that um, uh, paid attention, were very quiet, probably just moved through the grade levels their whole school career without being called on too much, without ga ga gathering the interest of their teacher. That's not acceptable. There's an example of a English language learner student who sat in class very quietly all day and the superintendent was monitoring the student and at no point in time was that student asked a question or volunteered an answer. And that's not acceptable. So we how do we have to do that? We have to ignite the kid's passion. We have to engage with every single child. That's the hard work and that's the heavy lifting of doing this. And children are remarkably resilient when it comes to strategies like that. Um, when you're talking about coping with adversity, I can't help but think about the fires right. that we had. It's maybe almost four months ago that they got started uh, back in December. And the way that our schools responded and that the way that the students and the parents accepted what was going on and partnered with the districts to get through that was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. You think that also was because of the way we've generated or you've generated a lot of professional development by going and doing a lot of the social issues with your teachers and with support staff to be able to engage them into the feeling and the emoting and the support that you give them. Yeah, I can't disagree with that statement. And the other thing which takes us back to the LCAP, the Local Control right. Accountability Plan, has a, a, a required component that is uh, uh, of parent engagement. We have to reach out to parents and other stakeholders but in the communities so of the schools. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to uh, to to uh, um, uh, access and capture these people. But we must. And what, once we do, what do you employ to get them engaged? I mean, how, it's even difficult to get them to come to an open house. Yeah. You can't drag them. Well, uh, luckily we have more electronic means. Ah. Well, through social media, even Facebook, believe it or not. Really? Where to, are you going To that? capture kids through our school districts, and we monitor that traffic very closely. Um, reaching out to, to parents to show them the success and the meaning that is there for them to grasp on behalf of their child. You know what I do a and, lot? And with partnering, them? being their partner. Partnering. And you have to partner. Yeah. What I do with my students, my average age student is about 85 to 107. I've got a couple of hundred of them. And what I, you know, my classes are usually driven by the student's request or what they'd like to see happen. We don't have any formalized curriculum, mm -hmm. although it's kind of a kinetic thing, it moves around all the time. But what I try to do is get, gauge them with younger groups for like for example uh, I, I teach in nursing homes and that's all the only place that I teach I teach at three separate ones I engage with a local high school which is in this case it's Foothill High School to get the kids that have to perform community service mm -hmm. and I get them to work together in cooperative situations in my classes I really think this is going to be a big thing of the future if it's not already. I really, I've been doing this for a long, long time, all close to 20 years, and I really see where there's going to be <coughs> this kind of engagement that really is beneficial for both parties, mm -hmm. and we can learn from each other. I, in Europe, it's done quite frequently, but here, not so much. Yeah, I think that cr cross-pollination is absolutely fantastic. So how do we do that? I mean, do it be, uh, but I know we can do it through community, ed, I mean, the community service because they have to do so many hours, correct, per mm -hmm. quarter or is it per semester, I'm not sure. Well, usually when something isn't going right, the common denominator is a lack of communication. Right. It's communication that will do it, okay. um, and persistence. Um, one of the reasons why I believe so passionately in public education, um, and you've heard uh, many times that it's the underpinnings of a democratic society. Correct. To have public schools. The other thing is I believe that they are incubators of, of, of building society in terms of mm -hmm. diversity and people and communities learning to get along. 
if you group yourselves into too many like-minded tribes, you tend to become more extreme. You isolate. You tend to become more rigid. Correct. Whereas in a public school where you all come, that's the great laboratory. And a common denominator. For, for building, uh, you know, America of the future. I really think the getting back to what I said a couple of minutes ago about the kids' march, to me, it projected hope. And it mm -hmm. gave me a sense of like, wow, you know, a, a certain level of comfort almost that these kids are getting it. They're not even old enough to vote, mm -hmm. but these kids know what is not acceptable and they know what the threshold is for that as well. I really was so encouraged by that. It just, it just blew me away. Yeah. Across the country, kids are gonna have a voice and these are the leaders of tomorrow. And I think back in the day, that would have been um, seen as something to um, absolutely prohibit. Well, look children at, marching, children correct. maybe even going off campus. Correct. Uh, children not expressing themselves because the adult world might not have thought they knew better. Look the, at our, our, our communities and education in general totally embrace that. I and got arrested result, for Vietnam sit-ins. The result was phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, really, in our day, it was not acceptable because mm -hmm. it didn't fit with society at the norms of that day. Mm -hmm. But now we are looking at a totally different world. Our world has been inverted inside out. It's a completely different world. And um, when you mention uh, things like the Vietnam era, there's some great parallels between oh, yes. what's happening today Correct. and what was happening back, say, in 1968. Correct. My, oh, they had a great piece in the paper in 68 this past weekend. I'm sure you saw it. I uh -huh. think it was in either New York Times or LA Times. We get both. But I, uh, my mother was always embarrassed about the fact that her child got arrested for uh, Vietnam sit-ins and also rallies. I mean, this is, but I, I was impassioned about that. These were my contemporaries, my friends that were being sent over there and killed. And now you have I a think little we're out of time. Of I just looked at the clock. Oh my goodness. You know, you got to come back. I mean, uh, I know you don't have any opposition to running, so please, when it comes up on the ballot, vote for Stan. Stan Mantooth, um, I guess today, uh, Mr. Stan Mantooth, for your Ventura County Superintendent of Schools. Come back and you can give us more stories. I love just yakking with you, just having fun. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to your audience. Thanks for, so much for being here. We'll see you next week.